get finished. Um, so uh, I'll just start out um, with uh, a, a set of introductions for myself. Uh, so hi, uh, I'm Mark Kimberly, as Bobby mentioned. Uh, I am an integrated systems architect at uh, Marvell, and I am also uh, the technical director for our ASIC business unit. Um, I am uh, very, very interested in chiplets and uh, um, managed to, to make the mistake of raising my hand a, a year and a half ago uh, when we were looking for volunteers to, uh, to chair the standards committee in, in ODSA. So uh, I'm very actively involved in the bunch of wires definition. I'd like to uh, hand it over now. Uh, we'll just follow along the order in, in the presentation. So uh, Valerie, would you mind uh, unmuting and introducing yourself? Yeah, um, thank you, Mark. Uh, so my name is Valerie Kugel. I am a senior distinguished engineer at Juniper Networks. I am a silicon and system technology architect uh, looking at uh, next generation Juniper systems. Great, thanks, Valerie. And uh, Ulf, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Absolutely. Uh, good evening from Sweden. Uh, my name is Ulf Sjöström. I'm a senior expert in SOC technologies working for Ericsson. Uh, I've been at Ericsson belonging to their ASIC or organization for more than 24 years. I go under a second name at Ericsson, Mr. Chiplet. Um, and uh, I will not take the liberty of introducing Andy. Uh, we'll wait until he's able to to get on and have audio. And unless Andy, you're you're connected and and, are, and uh, are able to speak. Mark, can you hear me? You are perfect. Yes, we can. Great. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Oh, hear great. You. Yeah, sorry for the tech technical issues. Uh, and thanks, Mark. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, I'm Andy Key. Um, I'm Google. Um, I'm, I'm working at Google. I'm chief, chief techno technology list and also IP tech lead. So one of my focus uh, at Google is that basically uh, I do die uh, fly and the chocolate. So it's very happy for me to be here to discuss uh, you know a lot of fun topics with you guys. Yeah, thank you. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, and I just want to get the conversation started a little bit here, uh, going through a recap of, of the um, last time that we did a panel discussion like this. Um, and then we'll give um, uh, Valerie and Ulf some time to share some, uh, some information and in their perspective on uh, chiplets and interfaces as well. Uh, so just uh, recapping um, some of the previous conversations that we've had in, in ODSA and in OCP workshops. Um, I, I think what we're here to talk about today is uh, the, the low power interface that any chiplet based system is going to need for die to die communication. Um, I wanted to point out that at least in, in my understanding and my experience, um, there's a wide variety of die to die interfaces available in our industry, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, uh, however, there is very little in the way of standardization around uh, die-to-die -die communication right now. Um, there's only one uh, standardized die-to-die -die interface that I know of so far. Although as Bobby mentioned in the introduction, if you were able to uh, attend just a, a few minutes ago, um, there are a couple of uh, these um, uh, FIs in development and featured uh, in OCP. Um, so we're, we're very hopeful uh, that as we move forward with those projects, we'll have more and uh, we'll have more uh, open interfaces that the community can can use uh, to leverage and build these chiplet based systems. Uh, we also have a, at least a dozen proprietary solutions that I'm aware of, and I, I think we we see new ones popping up here and there. Uh, but for um, for at least my discussion today, uh, I really just kind of narrow those down to look at the uh, look at the the qualitative metrics for uh, these three different interfaces, um, and I think. They each have a really interesting place in uh, in our chiplet architectures, and they're they're each worth um, uh, spending some time to to learn about and understand where they fit. Um, you know, highlights of of uh, of the different uh, of the different interfaces we can kind of see with the with the red, yellow, green, right? So so where we have red, it points to complexity for an interface. So certainly, you know, where we look at things like a 112 gig XSR 30 score, um, that does have that does have a high complexity. It's it's more work to implement. 
um, when you look at uh, OpenHBI, uh, it involves high package complexity um, because it's generally focused on um, you know uh, fine uh, fine pitch um, uh, fine pitch interfaces that that would drive advanced packaging. Um, and we also have the bunch of wires development, which is a kind of in between uh, where the interface really focuses on being able to scale to different bump pitches um, and, and trade off package complexity and design complexity with a few different data rates. Um, so I think it's, it's, very, um, it's very interesting how we see uh, different interfaces kind of uh, spanning the gap of organic uh, standard laminate packages and advanced packages uh, with fine pitches. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about at least some of the observations I have um, if through my own work um, going through and evaluating some of these different trade-offs. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll point out, um, there are there is a trend in some parts of, of the market towards just exceedingly massive packages. Um, this is actually a, a picture of one of our uh, products at Marvell that uh, drives to a fairly big, complicated package, uh, uses chiplets, and um, really is a you know when when we look at this kind of solution, um, we chose to implement this on an organic carrier on a standard laminate um, because large packages are generally a challenge for for dense interconnect package. Um, so kind of looking at looking at this experience. Um, I made some complicated graphs, which I'm, I'm relatively, uh, I'm maybe fortunately or unfortunately known for uh, in ODSA, and really wanted to look at um, these, uh, these challenge driving applications and the kind of area that they need um, for, for a, a high density interconnect on different packaging technologies. So I, I made up a, a formula for coming up with cost for high density packaging, and this is not uh, this is not perfect, but I think it's a it's a good approximation. And looked at what the applications are, what the applications that are really driving the most complicated packages, what they need in terms of area. So I looked at I looked at um, yesterday, today, uh, and tomorrow. Let me see if I can grab a, a mouse pointer here so I can point and show you. Um, so if we look at if we look at the driver, right? This application or these applications are driving really large areas, and that's the yellow line here. Uh, but unfortunately, the package technology is only able to achieve kind of the, the orange line that I show here. And what is also interesting is I calculated a cost delta. The blue bar is your normal package, and the gray bar is the incremental cost for adding some, some of this advanced packaging stuff. Um, so the, the interesting thing as we look at the most challenging applications is that um, if I can advance a little bit in my PowerPoint here, is that there, you know, there's this gap between what the applications drive and what we can achieve. Um, and there's a significant cost delta as we look at the, the next generation uh, coming up. Uh, so I also wanted to look at cheaper high density packaging because this is, this is really interesting um, because it, it's a much lower cost overhead uh, than this, uh, this uh, really high end stuff. And when we look at the more affordable high density packaging, you know, it certainly shows that there's a lower cost adder as we go through the, the needs of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, but the gap between what the applications are driving and what the technology can achieve is, is growing wider because we just aren't, aren't keeping up or we're not, we're not able to catch up to those, uh, those very high end drivers. Um, so that I think, um, is one of the things that's influenced the philosophy I've often had is that there really is no one interface for chiplets. For some of these high-end drivers, it very well makes sense for uh, them to be implemented with no high-density packaging, um, just because the industry is really not able to catch up um, to what the applications are, are driving to. Um, so uh, that's why I've typically um, been a fan of all different interfaces uh, for, for chiplets. Uh, so my conclusion before I hand it over to Valerie is that uh, you know in the in the race between advancements, um, larger applications are winning over our ability to implement uh, really complex packaging to put them together, um, and that uh, affordable high density packaging, which I think is is very very interesting, and we all 
we all need so that we can drive some of these chiplet based systems uh, isn't catching up fast enough to meet the very highest end applications. Uh, so my my conclusion that I wanted to share with the with the community today is that um, it's really important for us to look at both systems that use normal packaging and systems that use high density packaging and having solutions uh, in our in having standard space solutions um, in in this uh, variety of technologies is really important for us as a community. With that, uh, I want to hand this over to uh, Valerie to just uh, uh, share your perspective on uh, in package communication. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Um, so we can maybe move to the next slide. Um, yeah, it's, uh, this is something which uh, Juniper Network requires. So it's Basically, I'm not speaking here on behalf of Juniper Networks. It's I'm in the view which I'm in, you know, whatever I'm talking about is basically my personal view. So <laughs> let's move to the real stuff. Next slide. Thank you, Mark. So um, I, I want to give a, 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 a networking perspective and uh, why, why in networking world we're looking at multiple dies in, in, in a single package. Um, so one of the things uh, what we um, discovered and observed and learned along the way is that uh, uh, the bandwidth requirements um, are such that for e every uh, generation, new generation of ASICs, we need to grow ASIC die size. And we uh, basically already passing the point where, you know, single die size reaches just the reticle limit. So what it means that we really need to look at alternatives. And in the low left uh, corner, you can see uh, a, a plot, a bar, green bar, where you can see I plotted uh, um, an area of uh, several five generations of Juniper ASICs, and you can see that there is steadily increase in the die size. And at a certain point, you know, it, it starts flattening because of, you know, yield issues and reticle size, uh, you know, it's both of them are together. And that's uh, one of the uh, major factors uh, to look at um, packaging multiple dice in the package. The other important factor is that in many networking application, the IR circuitry, um, which is used for communicating with external world and for most of uh, networking applications, these are high-speed services, they become a, a bandwidth limiting factor because of scalability of IO. So even, uh, even if a core you know, can deliver as a bandwidth, the IO, cannot actually um, take this bandwidth out for external world. That's another important factor. And the third one is that um, um, there is also requirements and this requirements mostly driven to improve bandwidth power is to put multiple heterogeneous and multifunctional components inside one package. And such examples could be, you know, uh, HBM, the memory components, uh, optical component, uh, CPU and GPU uh, dies together. And um, on the picture, and in general, all these components, uh, they need to communicate uh, inside the package. So I kind of sketched a couple of pictures showing, uh, you know, what, what such an organic substrate can um, I have and what is the communication between components. In the large picture in the center, you can see that, you know, there are multiple options. Uh, you can have ASIC on organic substrate. You can have ASIC on, on a silicon interposer on RDL. You can have optics. Uh, you can have sort of styles and memories. And many of the sub components need to communicate with each other. And uh, on the couple of uh, uh, pictures on the right, you can see that 
uh, in some specific applications, you basically you take your ASIC and you split in two and uh, you need to have a communication between these two parts of ASIC or you have an ASIC and you surround them to sorters by sorters uh, uh, dice to enable to take the bandwidth out. Um, and um, next slide, please. Yeah, and um, I think it's important to understand and see things in perspective from the viewpoint of uh, system and inter interconnect. So I try to put uh, together one slide showing how the system uh, interconnect behave, what are the main attributes important for, for our today's discussion, starting from the silicon die uh, to uh, to PCB board. That's in general what we have inside the system. Of course, there are also other components. It could be also cable to interconnect, but um, I just want to give you a, a big picture. And of course, the numbers here is also, you need to remember, not exactly accurate. So we can start from the die, silicon die. And um, from the viewpoint of interconnect, what's important there? It's basically Wittons and space of copper lines, and I use notation 1a and 1a. Usually, basically, we can use the same Wittons space via dimension. So, in this case, also via dimension is very similar to the um, minimum line in space. Uh, distance and distance here is basically it's distance between uh, repeaters. Very often, you know, uh, we use repeaters. Um, unlike in the case of, you know, uh, PCB interconnect, we use, you know, uh, um, services, real-time interfaces. And, um, and the, the other one is speed. And yeah, let's assume that the speed is 1C. And just say, as a rough estimate, uh, for silicon die, for top level uh, interconnect, because we're talking about interconnect basically to bring major stuff no major communication from a, you know, one part of a die to another part of a die to external world. So we can say that one A in one uh, is around 0.1 micrometer in the current generation of technology. Uh, one B, which is uh, you know the typical distance we can drive, it's probably close to 0.5 millimeter. And speed we're talking about is around around one Gbps plus minus. And this is uh, the, the world in which most of Silicon Dye Interconnect lives is RC world. Basically, you know, if you know resistance and capacitance of wires, you can calculate as uh, a delay, you can understand uh, both power and signal integrity. So the next level communication, it's Silicon Wafer Interconnect when um, we can uh, basically communicate between uh, different dyes on the same silicon wafer, between actually adjacent dyes. So the in interconnect behavior is very, very similar to the silicon dye interconnect behavior, meaning that width, space, via dimensions, distances, and speeds are similar. They can you know, be slightly different uh, based on specific application, but overall it's a it's similar behavior and the similar type of interconnect, it's RC interconnect. So the next level of interconnect is um, when we start communicating through external to the dye um, media, and it could be a silicon interposer, type in, of interconnect or RDL interconnect, but both of them are based on silicon technology. So we see actually a, a, a quantitative and qualitative jump. The wires become wider and space becomes also wider. So it's roughly a factor of 10. So the via dimension also grows in this case, or oh, it's actually could be multiple vias. And we need to introduce another uh, important factor. It's uh, micro bumps, which dimensions are even more than 10A. So, and we're driving 10 more 
and the dis driving distance also increases by a factor of uh, 10 approximately and the same with the speed. And then depending on, you know, specific attributes of wires, it could be either RC or RLC interconnect, meaning that for, you know, high uh, end of this type of communication, there is inductive factor which we need to take into account. And then the next level of communication which brings another 10x factor, it's when we need to move and communicate on organic substrate. So in this case, uh, you know, width and space, uh, space grow by another factor of 10. So it's overall, it's, hundred, uh, it's a factor of 100, meaning that if um, width and space of a wire on silicon die was around 0.1 micrometer, here we're talking about 10 micrometer width space. Um, VA dimensions do not scale. They are, unfortunately, in the current technology, they're actually larger than this dimension. This is usually laser VS. And the bumps we also, which we need to use also, they're much larger than this 10 micrometer width space. Distances which we are able to drive also do, uh, go by another factor of 10. So instead of 0.5 millimeter, which goes to five millimeter. Now we're talking about, we can drive something around 50 millimeter. And speed also grow by another factor of 10. So instead of one GBPS going to 10 GBPS, we're talking about already 100 GBPS. And the media is different. In this case, we're talking about already transmission lines, meaning the media in, in which uh, the, um, the impedance is very well controlled. And these are transmission lines with relatively low or medium insertion loss. And finally, the next level of interconnect is PCB level of interconnect. We're growing by another factor of 10. The width and space of line, instead of being, you know, organic packages 10 micrometer becomes around 100 micrometer. And unfortunately, once more vias in this case, also much larger than this parameter they way above 100 micrometer. We need to use for contacts either BJ or LJ, which also have very large dimensions. And we can drive even more distance. We can drive probably close to 50 centimeters, but the speed will be essentially the same as in organic substrate. And the reason is that basically we are working with the same transmission line just the circuitry becomes much more powerful to drive. We're basically working with high loss transmission line. So of course, uh, currently in, in, you know, there are, um, you know, there are, uh, new, uh, there are a lot of new technological developments and uh, there are 3D interconnects, but generally 3D interconnect to put several things together, several silicon dyes, they fall in the first three categories, depending, you know, what specifically uh, type of a technology specific vendor uh, people are using. So um, uh, in, in today's discussion, we mostly will be focusing on silicon in, uh, interposer in RDL interconnect as well organic substrate interconnect. And Mark, uh, yeah, let's go to the next uh, slide, please. So, um, so talking about in package and interconnect, as we saw from the previous slide, uh, silicon technology-based interconnect, which is silicon interposer and RDL, they provide much higher wire density compared to organic substrate interconnect, which enables using relatively low speed signaling for the same bandwidth. And naturally, it means that um, the overall circuitry and design of phi in each technology, in each type of interconnect should be different. We, I, it, I would say it will be very difficult to have a single phi which will enable both uh, silicon interposer RDL and um, organic uh, package interconnect. So we, Naturally, based on the technology choices we have, we probably need to have two families of individual IPs. Um, and if I look at um, 
current uh, situation in uh, silicon-based intercoll uh, interconnect. As Mark mentioned, there are a lot of uh, proprietary solutions. And really the only available today uh, standard-based interconnect is actually HBM interconnect to communicate between uh, an uh, uh, HBM5 sitting on an ASIC die to HBM memory. So, and uh, this interconnect actually, this phi may serve, I would think, as, a, a, as an option for a single phi, which can be provided with multiple, by multiple vendors to enable maybe both die to HBM and also die to die high bandwidth signaling. Of course, there are um, some challenges because, um, you know, something which is mostly optimized for HBM signaling, this phi, might be not as great as, you know, a special die to die to interconnect, but this might be an option. And I would like to hear actually feedback from audience of what people think about such a thing. And if we look at organic uh, substrate, there are also uh, several proprietary solutions, but in this case, we also do have uh, um, a standard in development, which is OF community development is developing. It's called a CI, CEI 112 GXSR PAM4 standard. So this standard is uh, already in, um, I think we already kind of passed middle point in, in a pretty good uh, shape. And there are several vendors who already supply uh, uh, such IP. Of course, um, uh, the challenge I see is that uh, for some application, especially probably for ML, ML AI, um, the BR and the latency requirement might not be as good as, you know, uh, ML and AI uh, application need. And maybe there is something which can be done uh, and have a universal IP to, to be able to satisfy maybe several mar markets. And once more, ideally, if we can have one IP uh, which will serve all needs uh, on organic substrate. That uh, would be probably a good idea. And Mark, if we go to the next slide. So in a couple of final thoughts and maybe echoing what uh, Mark was uh, saying uh, regarding organic packages. So this, uh, what we observe is that the size of organic substrate increased dramatically in, several, in, in the last several years. And dimensions close or even above 100 millimeter on the side is not a distant goal anymore. Yet with current organic substrate technology, the cost of uh, uh, such a substrate is really skyrocketing due to very poor yield. Um, you can kind of use brute force solution like increasing line width and space, uh, bump dimensions and via pitches, as well as via dimensions. They in reality hurt uh, bandwidth scaling requirements. And uh, I believe uh, new equipment investment and new technology development is required. And we do see some uh, movement in this direction. Another important thing I would like to mention here that uh, naturally uh, for some interfaces, when a uh, size of organic uh, substrate grows, the distances which uh, these interfaces need to drive on the package also increase. And it becomes also a significant challenge if we start talking about, you know, speaking about, you know, sort of signaling, uh, 200 GBPS signaling, insertion loss on organic substrate becomes a challenge because packages do grow significantly. That's another factor which people will need to take into account in their design. And I believe that to be successful, new five standards and IP development should be not only technically, but also business-wise sound for IP vendors. And this will require collaboration across multiple industries and industry players. Uh, thank you. 
Great, thank you very much, Valerie. Um, and uh, Alf, maybe we'll uh, we'll switch over to you for for your thoughts as well. Absolutely. So let's go to the uh, second slide. Yeah, I will try to give you a perspective from our industry, that's telecom industry, or more specifically wireless infrastructure. So my first slide is around why do we need multi-chip integration. I call it non-monolithic integration. I see four really specific reasons to go in this direction. One is to create some form of scalability of your products. We are not in the business selling SOCs, but still we, by, by, by using multi-chip technologies, we can create SOC SKUs that transforms in, into different uh, product SKUs. Another reason is to, to achieve modularity. It, in uh, very many cases in our space, it's around doing functional partitioning. It's to create product variants. It's also about productivity and, and reuse and carry over of, of SOC solutions between uh, technology generation. And it's also a lot around divide and conquer instead of building one extremely com complex uh, ship, you, 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 you can split it up. Uh, third reason I see is, is really for doing heterogeneous integration where you really mix enabling technologies. A perfect example in our space is mixing uh, digital processing like in the in the dig digital front end processing with mixed signal uh, data converter technologies the fourth reason is to get more integration more than what really Moore's law allows beyond reticle limits uh, i have shown some illustrations on this uh, first of all the the, the picture from can do that I think illustrate all these four different use, use cases in a good way. I will come back to that picture. In the lower left corner, uh, you see uh, examples from our product development uh, where we have integrated uh, a digital chip for front end processing with data converted on, on package. On the lower right corner, you see an uh, example that's out in, 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 our, in our products today, where we really have used all four of these reasons, scalability, modularity, mix of technologies, and, and more than more. This is a 1200 square millimeter uh, dye complex with, with uh, three diff different modern technologies. Uh, yeah, there are other illustrations here, some examples from AMD. I, I think, Mark, you showed uh, uh, excellent examples from, from, uh, from uh, Marvell with, with, with a switch. I, I thought I was thinking to include this as well here. Uh, ultimately, I think we want to come to, to the DARPA pic picture or illustration here where we simply could drop down chip existing chip laid to create solutions. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, let's talk about some properties we need in our interfaces. This is not per se requirements on die to die interfaces. This is more generic requirements in our, our space. Uh, Building telecom equipment, we, we have extreme requirements of availability that translate in, into reliability and quality on, on, on technology. Uh, we need to do background adaptations on uh, every high speed link, but, but it needs to be non intrusive. We uh, carry timing, uh, air interface timing, very critical our solutions over these interfaces. So we need robustness in, in forms of timing and jitter. Uh, 
we need early availability of any enabling technology. There are generally very long cycle times in definition, development, and product re releases. We need leading edge technology because we, we, we are in, in, in the parts of our portfolio, we need the lowest possible power dissipation. In other parts of our product portfolio, we need the performance or pro processing density of the latest technologies. We have very specific environmental requirements in, in our space as well. Typically, the operational temperature for our products is, is in minus 40 to 115 C, in many cases even extending up to 125 C. We need our, our uh, technology to be very energy efficient. We need flexibility. Any file or interface we, we add on our ASICs or SOCs usually have multiple purposes in different product variants. We need uh, standards, we need interoperability, cross standards, cross technologies, cross supplier, suppliers. Uh, I would say we look, look up until now, at least we've been looking at quite limited bandwidth over, over the inter interfaces. Typically we are below one terabit bidirectional be, be, between any SOCs. Uh, all technology is of course to be cost efficient. A little bit to give some insights of what kind of interfaces we are looking for when it comes to die to die. We are looking quite a lot into standard interface. It's, Ethernet kind of interfaces, AXI buses, CPRI, which is the a standard 3GPP interface between uh, baseband processing and radio serial. GSD interfaces, PCIe, we're looking into interface standards like CXL. But we also have some proprietary uh, in interfaces. We have a proprietary accelerator interface, but we also have the, the more low speed normal stuff like I3C kind of interfaces. Next slide, please. This is my final slide where I, I try to give some illustrations on some examples that we have been looking at or have, have, have done. I mean, the first one uh, with, with the red arrow is really, really partitioning of a design. It, it's by, by uh, separating processing dice with ion and common function fu functionalities. Processing in our case mostly mean DSP processing. Here to, to partition a design, we would like an ideal interface, a perfect interface with no or very low bit error rates, very low latency, low power. It shouldn't uh, consume too much real estate on the ship. Uh, ideally something very light phi, file layers or, or very light file layer. Ideally, something that wouldn't break up the design methodology. If we could have an interface that, that we could use the normal static timing analysis based, the design methodology would be perfect. I strongly believe that a parallel type of inter interface fits this purpose best, bunch of wires or, or, or some proprietary interface. And really, in this use case, I, I really think proprietary interfaces could still be okay. Of course, it's always good with standards. If you look at the second example, and this is more, more do, doing the mix or the heterogeneous integration where we would like to combine our ASIC with, with a processor chip, with an NPU, a switch or FPDA or something else. Typically here we would have more kind of a standard interface that, that, that is a little bit protected by, by high, high, higher 
uh, layers up to transport layer, perhaps. So we, we could be more be, more tolerant in this case. We can also tolerate a little bit more latency. Uh, I think it's more a serial kind of interface would, would, would be preferable in this case. One problem I see, see at least with silicon interposer based interfaces, you always end up in kind of a Tetris problem. You must really take care of how you design form factors of FIP to make, make, make them fit together in, in, in a package. Interoperability is wanted, and I think really in, in, for the purpose of this kind of integration, the integration XSR could, could, could be a, a perfect so, solution going forward. Then we have a, another example of, of where we're mixing technologies and doing heterogeneous integration. In, in our kind of application, the natural one is to integrate digital processing together with with a weak signal like data converters, but it co also could be around integrating sort of styles and maybe also optical engines. Absolutely, we want something that it's standard based. We probably are a bit more bit bare tolerant here. We had, have a, some kind of data link layer on, on the protocol. It needs to be energy efficiency, especially if we look at our radio applications. It needs to be an efficient interface. And, it's, and I think the final bullet is also very important here because I call it technology agnostic. It should be working all the technology nodes as, as well. Because if you look into data converters, they typically in, in a much all the technology nodes. So we can't rely on, on having an interface can be only in, in, in implemented the, or realized in the, in the latest technology nodes. The fourth example I, uh, I have here, it, it's, uh, it's really about integration of, of, of memory with, with our ASICs. Typically in our application, we, we need very high bandwidth. We, we don't need that much storage capacity. So HPM, you could argue it, 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 it's, a, it's a good solution. But we're also looking in, in, uh, in package side-by-side -side, the integration of LPDDRs. What, what, what's I, against really HPM, it's really it, then we start to require silicon interposes. So I would rather see something that's based on or, or organic substrates. Uh, of course, there are other examples as, as well, but I think I think uh, these are sort of representative examples on what we're working on or what we already have out in some some products. I think this was the the last slide I had in the deck. Thank you. And thank you very much, Alf. I really appreciate the presentation today. I know I learned a lot going through it. Um, we, we have our uh, first question of the discussion from uh, one of the most difficult audience members usually. Um, <laughs> there's a question of, uh, to, to our panel, uh, how do you guys see uh, FIs uh, stratifying by use case between high-end, mid-range, and low-end? Um, maybe I'll, uh, I'll hand this question to, uh, to Andy because we didn't, we, we didn't go through specific charts for you. So we'd love to get your, uh, your feedback on, on how you see the industry, whether we're gonna have different FIs for different types of applications or whether you think that uh, there would be uh, some place where, where um, you know, one FI would be useful for a lot of them. So Mark, uh, do you mind to elaborate the question one more time? Sorry, I, I, I think I missed that. Sure, sure. Um, so, the, so the question was, how do you see FIs? How do you see the different interfaces um, stratifying in our market by, by different use cases? Do you think there's going to be a different FI for uh, high-end devices, a different one for mid-range devices, and a different one for low-end devices? Uh, or do you think there's a way to kind of bridge these gaps in between them? Oh, I think, uh, thanks, Mark. I think that's a very good question, actually. Um, so I can share uh, um, a little bit on uh, insight on, uh, on my side. 
So I, um, I think from a very high level point of view, I do believe there are uh, different, for different use cases, there are different kind of best choices, like for different files. For example, I'm basically uh, just looking at die and die again, right? And, and, and some of the use case, uh, we are really uh, trying to push the bandwidth limit and uh, the latency and energy efficiency. And that requires a uh, very advanced technology on the packaging side and, and also uh, 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 a very aggressive design from the file side, right? In the meantime, there's also some of the uh, architecture choices we made from, from our processor design, such that you know you, you, you partition the chip in a, in a way you just need a relatively uh, small bandwidth and you, you are, you're latency tolerant. Uh, but in the meantime, you also want to reduce the cost, right? So those two kind of scenarios kind of distinguish what kind of file you it works best in your in, in your application. So in, in one scenario, it would be really like a, um, a HPI or or, or or high bandwidth memory like uh, interface and to really squeeze the performance and get a very good energy efficiency. The other case, you know, since we're talking a lower cost and, and relatively mid-range uh, bandwidth, so we can consider uh, like basically um, XSR and uh, also the BW interface. So, so I think there are actually this kind of relationship that you can optimize in, in different social space. Great, thank you, thank you, Andy. That's really great insight. Uh, I just want to um, just want to let you know you're a little choppy on the audio. Um, you, you, we could probably uh, we'll probably be chatting with uh, with Valerie and Ulf a little bit. I don't know if you can dial in, but that might uh, that might help us hear you just a little bit better. Um, but I but I, for, sure, for I'll, I'll yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, I, actually, I, I think this is a really really interesting thank question. You. Maybe we can. Uh, we can float it uh, by um, by Valerie and in, Elf in as well. Um, Valerie, can you share your your opinion? Do you do you think FIs are gonna are gonna stratify into into different application levels? Like, is the uh, are we gonna see things like the XSR really only used on the highest high end devices, uh, or do you see um, more uh, more cohesion that we're gonna be able to have uh, one FI fit fit multiple spaces? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough question, right? So I don't have a crystal ball. I would say that, you know, um, um, it's all will be driven by uh, money at the very end, right? So we can talk a lot about technology, but finally it will be driven by money, you know, and uh, it will be, you know, company specific decision and, you know, timing and, uh, I would say that me, uh, many companies will try to reuse existing technologies as much as they can, because developing uh, just developing IP in modern nodes is very very costly financially and also time wise. So I would I would think that in many application uh, people try to reuse whatever is available. Now here comes the tricky part. Sometimes whatever is available actually will come with the vendor you use. So what it means that uh, whatever is available could be a standard, but also could be a pro pro proprietary thing. That's, uh, that's another kind of uh, facet uh, which we shouldn't miss that, you know, this IP can be available, but it still will be proprietary. And of course, ideally, uh, you know, you would like to make this IP um, uh, as a standard IP, uh, but in many cases, people will take the risk and they will use it given, you know, their specific situation. So I think overall, it, it is a mixed bag and it will be a mixed bag based on specific company and specific circumstances. Great, thanks, Valerie. And and Alpha, uh, maybe the same the same question to you. Uh, we actually saw in your your last slide uh, really a scenario where one one system would would by necessity kind of drive a number of different interfaces. Um, so I'd really like to get your perspective on on how you see it stratifying by by kind of the the complexity of the device and and uh, mm -hmm. w which interfaces make sense. Yeah, I I I don't think we 
probably never will see you one five fits fits all. And as I said in my pre presentation, I, I think different types of five serves different purposes, different kind of in, in, in integrations. I completely agree with Valerie. The, 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 there could be practical reasons you try to reuse a, a phi uh, for, for, for multiple purposes. But I, I think interconnect technology or die to die interconnect is such a important uh, space go going forward. So I, I, I think we, we will see really purpose build solutions and technologies and, 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 and phi's for at, le at least a, a, a couple of different <laughs> purposes. Great, thank you. Um, and another another question from the audience: um, What needs to be harmonized across FIs, even if the data plane is different? Um, for example, uh, security management. Um, maybe um, maybe I'll, I'll hand that one uh, back back to you, Valerie. What do you what do you think we need to to make sure works consistently across, really across any kind of interface. Uh, and by security, I think I'm not sure if I fully understand meaning security of the data. Yeah, yeah, I think so. How do you, how do you, well, well I guess I think the question is, is well, I, I'm interpreting here just from, from what's written, um, but I think the question is really, is really trying to open it up broadly. What, what are the things that, that we need to have for all different die-to-die uh, uh, -die interfaces. Um, you know, for example, uh, how do we make sure that we've got uh, security of that connectivity between the die? How to make sure that we've got uh, uh, security wrapped around uh, the data in the system? Yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah, it's even more complex than you know, just having a standard, right? Just having a yeah. standard, a standard would be great. Security, integrity of the data. It's a yeah. It's a, it's another level. Um, I would think that probably. I, I mean, in, in, like a, on a practical level, probably this is something which needs to be handled at a, at a bit uh, higher than physical layer interface. Um, um, that's the way I see it, uh, and. Um, it will definitely will become more and more important um, um, to, to make sure that the data is secure. Uh, but I think uh, the way I see it currently, it's probably should be done above uh, phi. At this point, we're struggling actually to have, you know, just a couple of standards. To, to, so, but it's definitely will be a, a very, very important question. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really valid point, right? If the uh, if uh, this extra function is handled in the in the link layer, it can be uh, it can be interface independent, which certainly makes a lot more sense from a system point of view. Um, the other the other question, um, uh, I, I won't ask all of you guys the same question because uh, we're we're definitely going to approach our, our time limit before we run out of questions. Um, but uh, a question that I that I have for Alf, and I think you mentioned this in your presentation that um, that you know uh, we could we could really use um, um, multi-chip integration um, to to kind of uh, give us Moore's law. Uh, I guess uh, my my question to you is: um, Do you think that we're really uh, going to be able to keep pace with with Moore's law, meaning? Uh, will we really get a doubling of device performance every cycle by leveraging multi by leveraging complex packaging or or multi-chip systems and you know building even more more massive integration things like like 3D and and will we just keep big I think you mentioned one of your your products was 1200 square millimeters will we be able to keep growing in in that manner uh, or are even with uh, even with chiplet based systems are we gonna are we going to get bogged down by by the slowing of Moore's law? Uh, uh, absolutely, an interesting question, and I, I I think the simple answer is yes. I, I strongly believe that the next next wave or phase or whatever you call it of Moore's law is is to we need to go into 
multi-chip in integration, where whether or not it's 2.1D or 2.5D or 3D integration. I, I think the, 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 this is eventually will, will continue to allow us to in, integrate more, more and more and, 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 and keep up with, with what, what used to be Moore's law. We, without it, uh, seeing the slow, the slow, slow down in, 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 in the, in, in the uh, uh, silicon or semiconductor uh, uh, or the classical more, more, more slow. We, 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 we really need this. And I, I, I think one good thing with this, we are not limited by, by reticle sizes anymore. Uh, and and I, I see great improvements over time also in, in packages. And, and uh, I, I mean, uh, maybe 10 years ago, you were crazy if you talked about the organic package on 100 by 100 millimeters, but this is possible today. Yeah, and you can yeah, integrate a lot in that. But the key to this integration is really the interfaces. Absolutely, that's a that's a that's a great perspective. Um, I want to um, uh, I want to switch over to Andy. Uh, Andy, hopefully you can uh, you can hear us, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to hear you clearly. Um, uh, my question for you is: um, Do you expect that you? And I think this is something actually that that maybe we'll go around the group because I, I think everybody's. Everybody's mentioned this. Um, do you expect that additional levels of integration are um, are going to be able to essentially make the interface disappear um, from a uh, from a system level? Are, are we going to get to the point where um, we basically are going to go die to die and um, not have to not have to really consider what's going on in between them with with FIFOs and with uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, protocols to do error correction. Will we will be, be able to uh, advance technology to a point in the near, very near future, where uh, where those interfaces can become transparent uh, from a system point of view? What do, What do you think, Andy? Yeah, sure, Mark. I think that's definitely an interesting uh, question and perspective. And uh, from one side, I think uh, it is true that uh, with some more advanced packaging technology, like three D stacking. And, and you know, like we were on, uh, you know, WOW and, and COW, all those technologies, we are able to get a very dense and, and efficient communication between dyes um, with with little uh, uh, com complexity from the physical design or five perspective. In the meantime, I do believe that there's still a, a tremendous value by having the the the, the more like tagline five or tagline uh, interface. In a lot of scenario, for example, if you were to um, having a die split scenario in, in 2D, 2D or 2.5D um, uh, cases, right? In that case, you, 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 your, your major motivation is to try to cut down the, 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 the cost associated, associated with vertical limit. And in, in parallel, the 3D stacking, which is enable you to have more uh, computer area or more SRAM stacking. And those two things, I think, or we'll, we'll go in parallel instead of uh, replacing one or one or the other. So having said that, I think there's always value to having like more like traditional like with Wi-Fi in, in different scenario. Well, there's more and more uh, uh, innovative packaging technology can reduce the barrier of design compli complicated Wi-Fi, um, for, for example, for 3D stacking and, and other, other cases. But I think th those two, two things will not replace um, each other, it will it will, it will co coexist in my opinion. Great, uh, and and uh, um, we're running short on time because this has been a, this has been a, such an engaging conversation. Um, just a, a real quick uh, same question to uh, same question to you, Valerie, for a minute, and, and then I'd like to hear uh, Ulf's response to the same question. Do you guys, do you think um, we could we could uh, continue kind of building in our, our ability to integrate to make that disappear and transparent to the user? Yeah, it's a difficult question. So I think um, the reality is that uh, all this depends, all this de is dependent on technology. So whatever we build in our mind and using tools is in reality 
is all just to make sure that the, we fit the technology envelope. And to be more specific, um, the technology and the IO which are required to overcome these interfaces which are created by technology will dictate if it's possible actually to make these uh, interfaces transparent, to make it just a simple buffer which can be handled by STA, have the same reliability. I mean, it's a dream, right? Yeah. So yeah. reality today is that uh, for multiple reasons, um, we don't have such a thing. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and how about you, Alf? What do you think? Uh, in, our, in our last 20 seconds, do you think we can do in it? In the last 20 <laughs> seconds, I, I had it in my partitioning example. This is really what I would like to see. Uh, short term, no, I, I, we won't get any as, as simple as a simple buffer and uh, then we can time and close with the STA. But midterm, I think we will see something like this. Will it be a standard interface or will it be proprietary? I, I, I think it will sure, come first in some proprietary op option. Okay, great. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Valerie. And thank you, Andy. Uh, it's been a great engaging discussion today. I appreciate all, all of your time today and the preparation of the material beforehand. Uh, I know I, I've learned a lot and uh, we've got quite a crowd that's out there. Um, you know, engaging in the conversation too. So uh, thank you guys uh, very much. And uh, uh, Archana and Bapi, I'll hand it back over to you.